And um, so yeah, it's myself and uh, Michael here today. Just for those of you that don't know us, I know there's a lot of familiar faces here, but also a lot of new ones. Um, Mickey and myself work for I Associates. We're a specialist IT recruitment company based in Bristol, but we, we cover all of the, the UK. And just wanted to mention in case any of you guys didn't know, we organise um, .NET London, we organise .NET Reading, also .NET Cheltenham and .NET South Wales. Um, we also... speakers by chance. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we, yeah, we organise a number of meetups. And if you're interested in finding out more about any of those meetups, feel free to check on our website as well. And, um, and a lot of you know Deepak um, from the Reading and London.net meetup groups. He was hoping to be here today, but unfortunately he's not well. So we're uh, hopefully going to be seeing him next time as well. Cool. And um, I know you don't want to hear too much from us and you're here for Scott. So without further ado, uh, I will pass you over to Scott, um, who will be sharing his screen. And uh, yeah, we'll, um, Scott obviously said he's happy to do questions throughout and then we can do a Q&A at the end. So enjoy. Yeah. Thank you very much, Scott. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Let me share my screen and learn how to uh, deal with Zoom. So share screen, screen three, share. Does that make it full screen with just the, like, am I visible anymore or is it just the screen? I can see you on both screens. I've got two, so I've got all the whole chats on the right hand side. Well, that's just fancy. Still, uh, Who else has people in the background? Too many screens. <clears throat> all right, you can see this though. So if I do this, we're good. Yes. Oh yeah. All right, lovely. All right, cool. So uh, I love that someone earlier said, uh, "What is WSL?" Which means that they came to this talk with no preconceived notions, which I appreciate. So I'm here to talk about WSL, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, the idea here <clears throat> is that what if Windows could run Linux in a way that was truly integrated with Windows that didn't do it in a way that was a virtual machine where you fire up a big square with a 30 gig VHD virtual hard drive and you go, we're starting Linux, woo! And then it's like a whole thing. People don't like virtual machines because they are heavy and exhausting and weighty and they take up, they're this big lump of coal that sits on your hard drive. Um, additionally, maybe people don't wanna run Linux because uh, they, like, they like their audio uh, drivers to work. Uh, that's a bit of a dig. I'm just kidding. But you know, you, you like Windows. I enjoy Windows. Now I've been doing software for 30 years. I'm all, honestly, you know, non-denominational. I love all people. Use the operating system that makes you happy. Mac, Windows, or Linux. But here's the deal. If you go out on the internet right now and you're a uh, Windows user, and I like and enjoy Windows, and you go and Google for you like how to install Redis, and you go and find a web page and it says, hey, how to install Redis. And then you get to the instruction and it says, okay, all you do is open a terminal and then you see this. And then you kind of go, because you know, as a Windows user, this is a place that you're not welcome. Because you say, well, hang on a second. My prompt doesn't look like this. My prompt looks like that. And none of the commands work. And they say, yeah. Just go and type apt install Redis server and it'll be awesome. And then you realize that it's bad. If you've ever tried to install Ruby on Rails on Windows, you'll know that it is uh, a pit of despair and it will ultimately go to a bunch of complications and confusions. And uh, it, more importantly, your development environment doesn't match your server, right? writing Ruby on Rails on Windows and trying to get it to work in IIS is not gonna represent the Linux machine that you're ultimately gonna put it on. But I like Windows, I like Explorer, I like my hotkeys, I like the machine that I'm using. So how can I do both of those things? Well, there's a couple of things that are wrong before we go and do this. The first thing that's wrong is if you go into the command prompt, I just typed in cmd.exe, you get this thing and <clears throat> this looks like it's ripped squarely out of 1995. 
because it is in fact ripped squarely out of 1995. Uh, that's probably the last time that this was updated. I remember the day that we got a font dialogue and we could put true type fonts in this dialogue. That was an extraordinary day. Um, people conflate terminals, shells, and consoles. This thing here is called the command prompt, but there's command.exe, which is the thing that takes my input and spits out some output. It's the thing that understands DIR. And then there's this console here, the alternative consoles out there. There's Terminus and Con Emu and Console 2 and on and on and on. There's a ton of different interesting terminals that are available. Um, this is not a good one. This is a trash terminal. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, why would Windows allow such a lousy terminal for so many years? Uh, and that's because of a fundamental philosophical issue that Windows has versus Mac, and that is compatibility. Windows, you may hate it, but you don't give Windows enough credit for running software forever. Uh, everyone complains that we don't support Visual Basic 5, but they don't seem to worry that Visual Basic 5 still works just fine on Windows. Um, you can run VisiCalc on Windows 10 45 years later, and it works just fine. But I've got a Macintosh that just I woke up on a random Tuesday and discovered that it was no longer supported, and it's been stuck on Snow Leopard ever since. These are philosophical differences. So how would you go and change something like this, the console host, and not break 1.5 billion computers? So what they've done is they've created a new terminal and they've split up the console into a pseudo console, much like how Linux does things. And I'm gonna now run the Windows terminal. This is entirely written from scratch, all new modern stuff. And it can be, it can be transparent and it can be, you can control scroll and it can be pretty and you can do all kinds of cool stuff because it's a complete rewrite of a proper modern terminal on a uh, new technology. It's entirely open source. And more importantly, it has tabs and the ability to have as many shells as possible. Now note, I can still go and open up the command prompt, but I'm trying to juxtapose the difference between the thing that drew the Chrome on the right and the shell, which is different. Additionally, if you've ever had a situation with the old original Windows command prompt, you may have found that when you're building your software, it's really, really slow because you have a lot of log spew. So here's a dirty little secret about Windows. If you make this really small, your program runs faster. That's a horrible, horrible thing. In fact, your program runs the fastest when it is minimized. That's because they've got synchronous output with your, uh, your program. It can only go as fast as uh, it can paint and it has to wait for the paint. But this new terminal is written in with DirectX. So it can do a thousand frames a second. It can go unlimited speed and it's completely asynchronous, uh, which gives you uh, the fastest possible output that you can get. So it's important to juxtapose those two things. And I written, wrote a blog post about it, about a console, a terminal and a shell, because I think it's important to understand the historical context of these things. And I walk through this in the post where I specifically talk about what a terminal is why it's called that and how a console and then ultimately a shell became a thing. Because you'll talk to someone about the Windows subsystem for Linux and they'll say, oh, I already have that. I have Git bash. It came with Git and it lets me run LS and it lets me run, you know, Vim. So I already can run Linux applications. What that is, I just opened Git Bash and I ran Vim. Those are the GNU utilities and user mode recompiled for Windows. 
If you run things like Sigwin, no disrespect to our friends at, oops, no disrespect to our friends at Sigwin, um, but Sigwin is not Linux. It's a Linux simulator. Okay, this is GNU user mode binaries. These were formerly what are called ELF binaries and they've been recompiled into Win32 binaries. And that's okay, but it's not Linux. It's a shell simulation of comfort food. Um, and I don't know how to close Vim, so I'm just gonna close that. Just kidding. Um, so let's bring ourselves now to, to WSL. If I'm here at, at any command prompt in uh, my terminal, and I type in WSL dash dash list dash V, I can go and see a list of N number of Linuxes that I have on my machine. And I wanna point out a couple things. There's a star here indicating that that's the default distribution. Some are running and some are stopped. And there's a version discrepancy. One of them is version one. So there's WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux version one. Let's run the one that is marked as version one. I'm gonna say WSL dash D for distro and I'm gonna say Alpine. Now that happened instantly. That didn't fire up a virtual machine. It wasn't like, and now Hyper-V, and then you go to lunch and you come back and it was that. Now <clears throat> I'll just run top. So I'm running Linux, I'm running Alpine, I'm running top. Let's open up task manager and sort, and let's go and find what's going on here. And I can see Windows processes like calculator and a bunch of other crap, Apple crap here. Um, these are Linux processes. Now, another interesting computer science thing, there's a philosophical difference in how Linux and Windows do processes. Processes on Linux are incredibly lightweight. When you start a process, it goes like that because it doesn't copy the entire environment. It doesn't, it doesn't know that there's a window. It's just an instant thing. It's like a thread. Um, so architecturally, when you're doing things on Linux, often you'll have a process and then it'll fork. And now you have two. And they fork and they fork and they, they come back together. F creating processes on Windows is heavier. Windows always assumed that a window would have a window and they would copy the environment and they bring things forward. So there's many milliseconds of additional time spent creating a process. So simulating the ability to run Linux on Windows would be a problem if all the different processes that Windows needs to create, that Linux needs to create, mapped directly to Windows processes. So Windows created a thing called a Pico process a tiny lightweight little process. And these are Pico processes. They have Windows PIDs or process IDs, but they are uh, being lied to. So let's talk about the lie. This is Windows subsystem for Linux version one. I'm gonna go into the greatest diagramming tool ever created, it's called Paintbrush. And I'm gonna go and give us a little bit of space here and let's draw some boxes and lines. If you wanna run Linux and you're hanging out up here and you have WSL1 uh, and it's got a Pico process. Um, when that process decides that it wants to call uh, a Linux system call, hey, I need to open a file. Okay, cool. I'm gonna make a call and it's expecting Linux down here, right? So it says, oh, I need to open a file. Is that cool? Well, there is no Linux. The system call doesn't exist. So we lie to it. We lie and we say, yeah, the Windows kernel will handle that for you. The Windows kernel jumps in and says, file open, that's cool. So WSL1 created a series of mappings between Linux system calls and Win32 APIs so that anytime someone tried to make a call, effectively their phones were being tapped and it was being redirected to the Windows kernel that I spelled, and I spelled kernel wrong, kernel. That is cool and interesting and useful, but it's not really Linuxy. If you imagine a slider bar from Sigwin, which is fake Linux, to Linux, 
which is Linux, and imagine that slider bar. How can you get as close to Linux as possible and as compatible as possible? Um, this is a step better from Sigwin, but there's no Linux kernel. So you're gonna find all kinds of things don't work, especially if there's a system call that we chose or for whatever reason technically could not implement. There's a challenge there. So people liked WSL. They liked the idea of running real Linux on Windows, but they really realized that they wanted proper full Linux, hence WSL2. WSL2 is a little different because it actually is being created in what's called a utility virtual machine. Now this is where the, the detractors, I was supposed to say VM mem, the detractors of this would say, oh, you just did this or you just did that. I think we as software engineers need to be a little bit careful when we say stuff like that. Anytime someone tells you about the architecture of a system, it's really easy to go, oh, well, you just, da, 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 da. oh yeah, it only took a thousand, you know, a thousand people hours and, you know, four years and the recompiling of the Windows kernel. But yeah, we just, da, 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 da. So yes, we can say we just did this because it's an oversimplification. It's a way of mapping what we understand to how things work. But Hyper-V is involved but Hyper-V doesn't fire up in that same way. If I go to Hyper-V on my Windows Pro machine, I don't have any virtual machines here. So I'm not using the Hyper-V client and I'm not firing up a 30 gig VHD. What I'm doing, what I'm doing, go ahead and, uh, we'll, we'll, I had, actually, can I, I mute? I have power, don't I? I can mute everybody. I'll let Michael, do that. I, I, I've just done it, Scott. Oh, you're a star. Yeah, cool. Okay. So WSL2 fires up and it uses a tiny utility virtual machine. So let's think about that. We've all run virtual machines before. Let's fire up Linux on Windows using a virtual machine in WSL2. Okay. I'm going to hit enter and start counting. One, 1,000. Okay. So that's, that's Linux. It takes less than a second. That is real full Linux. 20 processors, my real machine, it's, uh, it's a thing. So WSL2 is not using Hyper-V. If you go in into Windows Features, I'll show you where that appears. Go over into Settings. Come on, computer. Ah, there we go. There's a section called, I think it's called Programs and Features, right here. You know about that if you've ever used a virtual machine on Windows. This is using the underlayman, the, the pieces underneath Windows, the hypervisor platform without Hyper-V weight. That's important because if you think about WSL 2 and who might enjoy running Linux on uh, Windows, you think about students. Students don't want to pay for Windows Pro, nor should we ask them to. So wouldn't it be cool if we can do this on um, Windows Home? So what you can do is run WSL on Windows Home because you're not installing Hyper-V, you're installing a virtualization platform that is a feature of Windows Home. So you wouldn't have the Hyper-V stuff, but WSL itself works just great. So we go here and we say list slash V, you see the options, you can see this is running, this is running, these are stopped. I can actually go and say WSL dash dash help and give more detail and specifically shut down and terminate all distributions. If I wanted to, which I will, because it's interesting. Now these are gonna start shutting down and in a minute they're all gonna mark themselves as stopped and then I can go here and look at my memory. I can see already memories being reclaimed. You see this VM mem, it's down to 400 megs. That actually increases and shrinks in size based on its usage needs. So then I can go and fire up my VM again, one 1000, maybe 200 milliseconds longer because it was a cold start. And within here, 
notice where I'm at. I'm on a folder called Mount C. So I have access to the Windows file system, but I also have my own Linux file system. Oops, here. All right, so there is my home screen, my home uh, folder, but that is slash home slash Scott. How would I get to that from Windows? I can type explorer.exe, which is a Windows executable. I can hit enter. And I can see my file system because we're running a plan nine network server and looping back to ourselves. So I have full access to the Linux file system from Windows, which means, and this is where my Linux heads are gonna get really sad. Let's say that you can go and say, vim foo.txt, make a file, save it. There's a file called foo.txt. And now you either think that that's the coolest thing since sliced bread or that is against God's will and should be stopped immediately. What happened there is the executable process in Linux doesn't know how to handle Windows executables. So we get a last chance. We get a moment there to say, oh, we'll just pass that on to, to Windows. Okay. This is why, and I want to go back. Actually, Alistair points out, thank you very much, Unix versus Windows file system endings. Appreciate our uh, uh, line endings. Notepad was updated a number of years ago to support that. Isn't that exciting? So yeah, we can, uh, we can cause all kinds of trouble. I actually did an entire video on YouTube uh, about carriage returns and line feeds called What's a Carriage and Why Are We Feeding It Lines? Where I explained to the young people about how typewriters work and why line feeds are important um, as, uh, as we introduce our new uh, people into programming. I think it's important that they know their, uh, their history. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Here's where it gets even more interesting. Oh yeah, Dan, okay, Dan Clark is pointing out, it's interesting that it did not need to go like this, which would be a Linuxism. That's a great point. In fact, it doesn't need to know that because it's not going to Linux. As soon as it saw the EXE, if I type this, that won't work. These are great questions in the chat. This works, and once I did that, it didn't need the dot because Windows wouldn't have needed the dot. Does that make sense? Once, once Linux gave up, then it was on Windows to figure that out. So that's really helpful, appreciate that. Good questions. Okay, so now here's where things get a little goofy and there's good things and there's bad things. Uh, do -do -do. Okay, WSL1, Pico processes, oops. No Linux kernel. And the Linux file system, now buckle up, is the Windows file system. Seemed like a good idea at the time. What that meant was that you could go digging into the Windows file system into like app data local into the bowels of the beast and then you would discover slash user slash bin and you'd be like, what? They just tarred up, they zipped up, they tarred, T-A-R, they tarred up the Linux file system and they unzipped it in, in, in the bowels of Windows. The problem with that though, is you've got a Pico process that's a Linux process being lied to. So it's really a Windows process, making a system call to a file system, expecting a kernel file system driver being lied to, looking then for a Linux file system being lied to and looping back and then using the Windows file system. And in fact, Linux uh, file system access on WSL1 uh, sucks. And it sucks fantastically. Um, like if you hit NPM install, it's like, you know, 10 X bad than you would expect. But Windows, this is really counterintuitive. Windows 
file system access with WSL1 is lovely. That means if you access Mount C, you know, dev, my node app, you can run Linux utilities, grep and node and NPM install and all that kind of stuff. And it will work great because it's a Windows process and it bypasses all that stuff. But as soon as you start accessing the Linux file system on WSL1, it's a nightmare. Additionally, with WSL1, there was really no way to access the Linux file system. So we told everybody, put your code over here. Now, here's where it all goes to heck. We go here to WSL2, where the Linux file system access is 10x faster than WSL1. If you ever heard the term, my friends, uh, boiling a frog. You boil a frog, this is a software term. The way that you boil a frog is by turning the heat up slow till the frog doesn't notice it. And then if you introduce a new frog, you throw that frog into a hot pot and that frog is like, this is unacceptable. I mean, I'm not going to be in here. I'm going to jump out. If you have an organization or a person who is using WSL1 and you're like, I'm so excited about running Linux on Windows. It's a joy. What a wonderful thing. And then you put them on a real Linux machine and they're like, this is so fast. What was happening? Well, you were being boiled slowly by Windows. It was really slow and you never noticed. You, you were so in love with the warmth around you, you didn't realize that it was a boiling pot. So people using WSL1 didn't realize when they got WSL2 and they're like, holy crap, it's 10x faster. How is this possible? Well, it's faster because it's being talked to with a native Linux kernel in a native Linux file system. And that file system is sitting in a, a VHD, a utility VHD, not a container. There was a comment earlier in the chats about how containers work on this. This is not just a container. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, here's where it all goes to heck. And you'll see why this is both interesting and also tragic. Now I'm running a real Linux kernel on real Linux, which is lovely. It's super fast in a Linux file system. But if I go and access Mount C, dev my node app now, 10x slower. So WSL1, fast on Windows file system, slow on Linux. You see where this is going. WSL2, fast on Linux, slow on Windows. That sucks. So we want it to be fast on both. That is the goal. We will get there. But you can understand architecturally why that is the case but it cannot be expressed enough. It cannot be overstated. The WSL2 is faster. It's better if you want Linux. So I would encourage you to put your code if you're gonna be developing on Linux uh, in the Linux file system. So to be clear, WSL2, put your stuff on the Linux file system. Occasionally access the Windows file system. But if you're doing an, if you're looping, if you're coding, if you're compiling, you do not want your stuff on Windows. It will be way faster. But you might say, well, that's inconvenient. I don't really want to do that. That kind of sucks. Well, let's, let's find out. Um, what is the name of this? IO Associates? Associates? Net user group? We'll say. I'm making a folder. We'll call it that. I hope that's it. Uh, someone whose name I cannot tell, uh, it just says, oh, it's Tony, it says, if WSL2 is so great, why does Ubuntu default uh, to installing uh, in WSL when I open the store? Uh, briefly, I will mention that. The reason is when you have WSL, you have to set the default version. So if you have a system now, you might want to turn on say WSL dash dash set default version two, and then it will default by default uh, to version two. So yeah, eventually this will all be the, uh, the case. Okay. Uh, Hans is pointing out W Linux, which is, which is lovely. There's lots of great Linux distributions in the Windows store. In fact, if you go to the Windows store and, uh, and search for Linux, you'll get a bunch of choices. Ubuntu, Kali, multiple versions of, uh, Ubuntu there, uh, Raft, WSL, I think used to be called 
Um, is this no? That's not. That's not the same one. That's Raft as a front end. Where's uh, where is W Linux? Am I not seeing it? Am I just missing this? Oh, Penguin. They changed the name. W Linux is now called Penguin. This is a lovely, lovely. This is actually a Debian. Uh, Linux distribution, but it is isn't the first distribution that's been totally optimized for um, Windows Subsystem for Linux. Christian is asking what the best one is for .NET Core. I would encourage you just to use Ubuntu, uh, some LTS version. But ultimately, this is the other thing that's fun. It doesn't matter. I don't have to pick one. Pick them all. I've got five. Pick the one that makes you happy. But uh, Ubuntu is a good solid, uh, good solid choice. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, I made a folder. So I made a folder, I'm in Linux, I'm in home, Scott, whatever. I wanna confirm with explorer.exe that I can see it and the folder is empty, but it is definitely on the Linux uh, environment. Hans is saying in the chat, he built his own from Debian. You could also bring your own distribution. If you have favorite Linux, we have an import and an export feature. So you can in fact tar up your own Linux and then just import it. So you can use whatever makes you happy. Totally that. Uh, the Leroy is asking about the Linux file system. Are you limited to any restrictions of file system? A length you are not. You can go nuts because it's a real Linux file system. You go as deep as you want. There's no max. All right, now I'm gonna say .NET dash dash version right here. And on this particular Linux right there, I've got, um, I've got uh, .NET 3.1. I'm just using .NET, but you can use whatever makes you happy. You can use you know, Rust or Go or whatever. Okay, .NET new console. Run my console app. I can say .NET, oops, .NET run. That's gonna go and restore, build, compile my app. That's cool. Now I can go against God and open it in Notepad just to prove that it's real. And then I can ask myself, well, how would I develop in here? Scott, you just told me to put all of my stuff on the Linux file system. And now I can't really conveniently access that, you know, other than doing weird stuff. I can type code dot. Buckle up, Joel Hammond Turner. He's excited about this. Oh, Tyth is asking, what is this running on? It's running on a Windows machine. This is just my Windows desktop. Um, now my d Windows desktop might seem beefy to you but it's actually a five-year-old i9. Um, it's got 32 gigs of RAM and uh, a hard drive. Um, if you go out and uh, Google with Bing for uh, Hanselman Ultimate PC version 3.0, I can tell you exactly what the parts were and when I built it. Uh, oh, sorry, it's two years old. That's the inside of the PC. I've got Ironheart living inside. That's the name of the PC. And I've got my regular little machine. It's under my desk right now. I'll put that in the chat, says Hamad. So learning how to use the Zoom. There we go. Got it. Deal. Cool. Now, I ran code dot. Let me close it and do it again because it's more dramatic that way. Code dot. Scott Edwards is asking, what if you want to use JetBrains? There's no thing, nothing that's keeping them from doing the same, the same deal. I don't know. I've not tried it but it would be cool if it worked. There's no reason that they can't do this. So here, Visual Studio Code is talking to WSL. Think about how Visual Studio Code is architected. It's client server application. <clears throat> if I open up program.cs and I decide to go and type console and I type dot, there's that moment where the IntelliSense pops open. Who provided that? What, where'd that come from? How did we know what to list out? That's called a language service. It's a call. It could be an out-of-process call, an in-process call. could have been a, a web sockets call. You don't know. You just know somebody typed dot and it popped open. So that language service can be remoted. It doesn't have to live here. Why can't it live? I'm saying Daniel O'Connor is saying, good Lord, what theme is that? I'm assuming you're saying good Lord in that I love that theme and I wanna be a part of it because it's amazing and not in any way saying that you find my Beyonce 
theme to be in any way offensive because I know that Daniel O'Connor loves the Yonsei theme. <laughs> um, when we hit code, uh, code console dot and it pops up there, that's, that language service is happening ex uh, externalized. Let's think about this in the context of extensions. Notice here, I've got my extensions. I've got 34 extensions that are running in my local installed Windows VS Code. But look at this, friends. C Sharp, C Sharp is a remoted extension. The extension model is such that I can run it elsewhere. Exactly, Pavel's saying the application's installed locally, the services can live everywhere. And I love that you point that out because there's no reason that those couldn't live in Azure as well, or Docker, or whatever, right? Alan Jeffrey says it needs more BTS. You're absolutely right. We need a BTS-inspired uh, theme here. Now, if I hit uh, control tilde, uh, tilde, 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 T-I-L-D-E, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, I open up a terminal inside of Visual Studio Code. That terminal is, in fact, WSL. Isn't that nice? Cool. So now... I can hit a breakpoint. I can then hit F5. Say that it's .NET Core, makes a configuration. Theoretically, will do something. Starts building, drops me into a breakpoint. Notice where .NET is, in store, is installed. So this is a really comfortable and natural way to do this. So Tony says, what if I want to use full fat Visual Studio or what I like to call Visual Studio proper? <clears throat> Old Microsoft uh, would say, well, you're screwed and you don't really want to do that. Uh, you should rethink why you asked that question and you should only do what we say. New Microsoft instead says to our friend Tony, that we can open up Visual Studio 2019. And you can use IS Express, Kestrel, Docker, or WSL2. Yeah, Bo. Sorry, wife's going to lunch. So yes, uh, that release, that WSL extension was just released uh, yesterday as a preview and you can check that out. It's up in the, um, in the, uh, in the um, what's it called, the marketplace. And I will put that on, um, I will put that on my blog. I love, I love talking to y'all and I love, I'm gonna pick on my friend Joel now. Joel and I are now besties uh, because he says, now I'm impressed. And it's so, we just ran Linux on Windows. We got six different Linuxes of a half dozen different distributions brought down to the thing. We've got multiple versions of Linux compatibility. We're doing what the, now I'm impressed. It only took me 46 minutes, but now I nailed it. Finally. Yes. Um, it is pretty cool though. And the great thing about all of this is that it's all basically open source. So w, the Linux kernel, it's open source. It's on GitHub because it's a Linux kernel. Um, all the extensions for code, you can go and see all of these things. Um, you really have a lot of flexibility that was previously un, unpossible, if that's a word that I'm going to say. Um, Hans is saying, how would you let the different virtual machines within WSL talk to each other? That's a great question. Um, you would let them talk to each other the way that any two Linux machines would talk to each other uh, over a network. So you could go and containerize them, Dockerize them and whatnot. Niels Johnson is saying, almost like Linux and Windows have become one. One could say that it's the year of the Linux desktop <coughs> on Windows. Um, here's another way to look at it. What if I said Docker images? Well, it says Docker is not in this Linux distro. Let's see if it's in this one. Ah, so you go into Docker desktop. Hans, you're saying what does not work? Are you talking about the private subnets? Yeah, you can bridge them though. You can do, you can go nuts. Check this out. We can go down here into resources and WSL integration and you can turn on Docker integration in these different distributions. And you can say, I want Docker available here and here. And then I can switch out, I'll go over to PowerShell and over here. Let's see if Docker is running on this machine. Oh, I need to start Docker. 
Oops. One more twelve. Starting it up. All right, I got to fire up Docker here for a second. Docker is going to use WSL now rather than the Hyper-V stuff. And you'll see that there is a Docker desktop WSL distribution right there. That should then allow me to do this. There we go, Docker images. So then what, what could I do with this? Could I go to let's say this folder, which is where I manage my podcast. And in this folder, I have some PS1 files. Ah, Dan Haywood is asking, what is Docker desktop data? Well, when you do Docker, you might wanna do volume mapping and think about how you do that. Docker desktop stores its data in a separate container so that one is mutable and one is immutable. Ian Barry is impressed with how I can keep up with the comments and the questions and still present. It's so actually, there's four other people here typing. Um, if I go into docker build.ps1, we notice a couple of things. First, remember on Windows, an extension, the PS1 extension is how Windows knows that something is uh, PowerShell. It's an association between the extension and the application. But Linux doesn't work that way. Linux uses a thing that's called a shebang. S-H-E-B-A-N-G, a bang is the, uh, the, the pound there. And a shebang, that's a real thing. You can go and Google it. Um, that tells Linux how to call that thing. And I'm using, in fact, uh, PowerShell, a PowerShell core, which I like to call Posh. And I'm using Posh. I can run Posh on uh, Linux or get out. Now, you might say, I don't really want another shell. I like Bash. I like ZSH. I like Fish. I like, I like any shell but PowerShell. You can use PowerShell as a scripting language. I'm not proposing that you use it as your shell. So when I've made this Docker build, in doing it like this, I've made a script that can then run my builds on both Windows or Linux, no matter where I'm at. I just run Docker build and I know it works. And on this case here, I just built my .NET application, which is my Windows, um, which is my podcast rather. But I can also do this. And now I'm gonna go and build it and test it entirely in Linux, which brings up an interesting question. If I'm doing the build in Linux and I'm doing the, the test in Linux, do I need to install the developer tools on my computer at all? Pavel's asking if I need Posh installed in the Linux distro. Yes and no, it depends. Um, PowerShell Core is also a .NET global tool and it can be copied locally. So if you don't want it installed on the Linux distro, you can just carry it along with your code in a bins folder or do whatever. David Rant is saying a long shot, but will GPU acceleration get a pass through for CUDA? Not a long shot, it's already happened. We announced it at build, it'll be out soon and it's in insiders now. So check that out. Hamad saying why replace command prompt with PowerShell? I will show you in a few moments, but I wanna point out that uh, within my distribution here, I've just gone and built that, I've run it. What if I, went somewhere to a tool that I did not have code for. For example, here's a folder um, that is uh, for Go. I don't have Go in this machine, let me see. You know, I don't have Go, the Go language. But I'm gonna say code dot. I'm gonna open up that folder anyway and try to write Go, okay? So if I go onto this uh, application here, it says, hang on, this folder has a dev container. Do you want to reopen this as a container? So I'm going to say yes. Starting a dev container. Look, remember I said before that VS Code splits itself in half. We're firing up the VS Code server, installing Golang. Who handles that? When I go dot, who handles that? Not I, said the fly. If I go and say, Control tilde, tilde, and I go look at my dev container. I'm in Linux in here, but Simlinks, where's this code? What we did is we did a volume map. The code is not in the container, it's volume mapped. So your entire comp compiler stack lives here. 
So I could say to somebody, hey, can you take a look at this code? They don't have to install anything. You could theoretically develop without ever installing the stuff on your own machine, which then brings up the question, could I do this with all of my code running in Azure? That's where you can really do some damage. So if I go over here and I say code spaces, I could potentially go and open up Visual Studio code spaces. Let's go ahead and log in. I can spell my own last name. If I can develop in a container, then I can just spin up another machine in the cloud somewhere, get, you know, pay per second billing or whatever. So it doesn't cost me any money. If I don't, if I leave it running, I can suspend it in five minutes or 30 minutes or to Pavel's point, run it entirely in the, in the browser. Isn't that cool? Um, Ashley, you're saying it looks like a Windows process from what I see. What is it specifically that you're seeing as a Windows process? Uh, so, so that would be Visual Studio Code. So when you open it up on WSL, does it open as a Windows process into yes, that directory? Yes, exactly. That's yeah. a great point. So to be clear, thank you for that clarification. To be clear, when we booted this up, Visual Studio Code itself is a client server application. The client is Windows. The server runs in Linux. So good, good. Um, clarification if that was not clear before. Now Thanks there were a couple of, yeah, thank you. A couple of questions about why you're using PowerShell at all, which I find to be quite scandalous questions because I find it to be a joyful, a joyful environment. Let me see why something's not working here. I'm going to look at my profile because my profile, oh, my profile stopped working. Let's find out why. So we're going to go to C users, Scott documents, PowerShell, ah, not Windows PowerShell. We're gonna go to Documents, PowerShell, yeah. Make a new file, there's the file here. This is like a bash RC for PowerShell people, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna steal from this one here, is that one there? Oh, good. This is an opportunity for me to use my own blog to set up a machine. Hanselman, pretty prompt. This is why you blog, friends. You blog so you can Google yourself later and then uh, write things down. So I'm going to just take this code here. I'm going to drop it into my PowerShell script there. I will open up another prompt. I'll go over to D, GitHub, Hansel Minutes, and now look. Now I have a lovely prompt with my Git branch, three items added, seven items modified, no items removed. It's dirty um, and wonderful. And then I can also use Z, which is a yummy way to start moving around. Z uh, is a command uh, CD changer. So if I wanna go to like the GitHub folder or my desktop, let me show you how fast that is. Let me go ahead and clear out. So I'm sitting here and I wanna to go to another drive. What do you do? You go D, and you're gonna go down here. It's like a thing, right? It's like a whole thing. I'm gonna go back up here. With Z, I can go Z, D, E, tab, enter. Z, H, A, enter. You see how fast you can move? Now, uh, Tim Spade is saying, yeah, knowing what branch you're on is your best prompt. You'd think it would be your best prompt. You would think that that would be the issue. But in fact, your best prompt is visualizing your blood sugar on your Git prompt in real time if you're a type 1 diabetic like me, because that's how I roll. So you can do all kinds of fun things with your prompt. And I went and did that with PowerShell and made it look lovely. So then I can have both my prompt and my blood sugar and a trend line. All right, scrumptious. Um, I think I'm running out of time. Oh, hang on, I gotta order food because the wife is on the way to Chipotle. Hang on, got the app, just take a second. Think about questions while I'm doing this. Uh, just quickly, Scott, someone on the chat asked um, if you can change the amount of resources that WSL uses. Yes. There is a secret um, like dot file somewhere. It's called like WSL conf and you can decide how much resource it uses, how much memory it uses. You can keep it from uh, taking over your machine, particularly memory reclamation is the, uh, is the biggest concern. 
and you can handle all of that. All right, order tacos. Uh -huh. Done. Yes, I was ordering tacos. Picking it up, 12.15. Uh, Mitchell's saying, if you use Postgres SQL in WSL 1, uh, I have not. I've done it in WSL 2, but I can certainly write a blog post on it. Where's the Z command, says Joel Hammond Turner. Let's go and see. What you should do is go to Google and then just put Hanselman in front of everything that you type. And then that will get you what you need. So if you type Hanselman Z, you'll go to a blog post on CD and Z. That's great. Um, Atul uh, Chauhan is saying, suggestions on the best place for important WSL commands. Oh my goodness, there's so many great resources. Go and search for GitHub WSL. Someone put together like the ultimate list of tools and things like that. Um, Tyeth Gundry is saying, you're not seeing the same WSL related images with Docker. If you're in Docker on Windows, make sure that you have used the Docker for desktop version that includes the WSL backend. It says use WSL2 based engine. If you're not using that, you'll be using the classic stuff. So you may lose that stuff. Um, Hans Kruis is saying how to fix networking in time. The Windows IP changes sometimes. Email me. It sounds like you're having some challenges and I'm not seeing those. Uh, Zoheb Sheikh is saying, what about running GUI Linuxes, GUI applications on Linux? Yes, you can do that now uh, and it'll be officially supported this fall. Um, Leroy is asking a great question. If you said which notepad.exe, where would it find it? Now, if you're on DOS and you say where notepad, it'll say, is it which or where? I can't remember, it's which on one and yeah, it's where on, oh, it's where on DOS, where notepad. There's two of them. But if you do that in Ubuntu, which is which, it finds the Windows one because the Windows System 32 stuff is in the, at the end of the path. But if you said which notepad, it won't find it. The exe is required because we don't want Linux people accidentally running Windows stuff and potentially hurting themselves. Do your Windows environment variables carry over to WSL? Uh, it depends on if you want them to. There is actually a thing called WF, WSL ENV, which is a colon delimited list of environment variables that you do want carried over. You get to decide. Um, Isaac, is, is there a way to debug applications running in WSL from the Windows box? Absolutely, you missed it, it was amazing. People are still in shock, it's fantastical. Um, how do I deal with the inevitable shaming and angry Linuxy crowds at work when I do my day-to-day -day work on Windows with WSL, says Scott Edwards. What I like to say is that success is a good metric. Excellent, excellent questions here. Can I say something about X servers? Yes, I use an X server that's called five, is it 510? Where's the X server that I use? We're going to include one and you'll actually won't be VNCing and X serving. We'll be remote desktoping into uh, Linux to make that work. Um, Atul Chahan is asking if there's a WSL3 plan that will be 10x faster for both Windows and Linux. The intent is to get native parity or as close to native parity as possible. Can you sim link between Windows and Linux? Yes, if you use the mount points because you're actually not sim linking between Windows and Linux. You're sim linking between Linux and Linux using a mount point. So you can, you can do that. You gotta be careful though, because uh, you don't wanna simlink like executables. You can get in a little bit of trouble there, but yes. Good stuff, good questions. Uh, X410, thank you very much, Hans Cruz. This is the one that I'm using right now. X server for Windows 10. Thank you for calling that out. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Can I change where distros are installed? My C drive is full. Move WSL2 distro to D. How to move distro. Looks like there is a tool called LX runoff line. Oh, it's already supported. I guess it's already supported. So yes, it seems like there is a way. Uh, Hamada saying, can you interchange between Linux and Windows seamlessly? Absolutely, that's true. I did not put a Hanselman in front of that Google. That is a huge fail. Good call. Uh, yeah, you can gzip up your TARs. When you export a WSL image, you're just exporting a TAR. Uh, so yes, you can absolutely do that kind of stuff. Billy Oliver has got a good question about file permissions and pseudo commands. 
So there's two issues there. File permissions, which is chaos. Um, file permissions are, if in fact, all bets are off. If you look at the file permissions on Windows, it's like, go nuts, woohoo, all permissions. Um, when you wanna run things as admin, sudo is still sudo. Who am I is still Scott in Linux world. So you are still running a tiny utility VM. So you have to think about identity. Access rights managed in WSL the same way they are managed in any other uh, Linux distribution. Although we will have group policy coming soon. So people will be able to manage that. And Windows, the, Windows, uh, the Linux kernel is managed now via Windows, um, uh, via Windows update. Yes, there is no sudo on Alpine. Doo, doo, doo. I'm scrolling back, trying to find anything else that I missed. Oh, la, la, la. Cool. Any thoughts, comments, questions? How are we doing, friends? I was going to type a question, but I think I'll just do it by voice. Um, so when I type in the one command or something like that on the WSL and it's incorrect, I get the annoying Windows sound. How do you turn that off? When you type in WSL. So if you're on WSL and you're on Debian, for instance. Oh, you don't like the beeping. No, it's bloody annoying. <laughs> Stop Linux beeping. I think it's set bell style. Set bell style none. You can let it flash also instead of beeping. Uh, Sorry, say that again, Hans. Flash. You're a little quiet. You can also uh, let, set it, let it flash. Uh, there's also setting for that. Uh, let's see oh yeah, you can set it to flash. That's a good point. So the bell style is a couple of different things and you can decide whether it flashes something or whether it does um, bell style. It's not a WSL uh, thing, it's just Linux or, or you, Yeah, yeah, it's, just, or it's Linux. just Linux doing its thing, right? Cool. Uh, do, 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 do. Did we record this? I hope we did. Good, we uh, did. Yes, lovely. we did. Yes, we lovely, have. lovely, lovely. Um, yeah, my phone just died. Samuel Yamokapa says, Yabongam Kunyana. Thank you, sir. Uh, any restrictions at the network level? There is some interesting network issues in that if you go out and say, IP config, you are going to see Hyper-V stuff, schmutz. WSL, though, has been given its own Ethernet adapter and its own subnet. And I think Hans probably uh, has spent a lot of time messing around with that. Uh, is KVM going to work fast? Uh, theoretically, we're trying to get everything to within a few percentages of native speed. Um, we're going to be using RDP and open source remote desktop to try to get things faster rather than using an X server. So that should make things very fast. Uh, but uh, get on the insiders and try that stuff. Is there audio pass through? It's on the list, but it's not done yet. Audio I don't believe is done yet. What tool am I using? Daniel O'Connor asks. I'm using um, Zoom it. You can hit control one, pause, draw. If you hit shift and control, you can draw arrows. And if you hit uh, control and alt, you can draw squares. Ashley's saying bell style is not stopping it. Am I saying, I'm not getting it. So I'll have to go and look at my own um, bash RC. So if you just constantly hit uh, backspace or something. Probably search your profile. If you just change, it doesn't work. You just type I'm definitely, source. Space I'm definitely profile. not seeing that problem at all right now. So I'm wondering if I turned it off years ago and forgot about it. What were you saying there, Hans? Search your profile. If you just just edit it, it won't do anything. But what I'm saying is, why is it that I don't have it beeping and he does? And because he didn't uh, source his bash RC. Oh, he didn't source the bash RC. Oh, uh, yeah, good point. So go ahead and close and start again or source your bash RC. Uh, David Rant's asking, what am I looking forward to on the roadmap? Um, probably the GPU stuff, I think, is the most significant. 
being able to do um, Docker based um, machine learning. But right now, Docker is the is the is the the amazing part. It's the it's the best part of the whole thing. Once you get Docker for Windows working, Docker for um, Docker for Windows supports WSL. So when I go Docker here, like I'm in Linux and I just did Docker images, and now I'm in Windows and I go Docker images, and it's the same stuff, then you can start doing some real damage, which is a good thing. Uh, William's asking about WSL GPU access. I think it's in, in, in fast, you're right. Um, fast is not that scary. I think a good safe thing to do would be to find out when it comes to slow. And then um, when it comes to Windows Insider slow, which is now I think called dev, um, then it's quite stable. You don't have to like update Windows every week or whatever. But my guess is this fall, but I don't know. Cool. Um, do I recommend Alpine for Docker given it's so small when I'm deploying? Yes, um, that's a good question. I recommend the smallest, Tony's asking about Alpine versus Ubuntu. I would recommend the smallest um, distribution that you can possibly manage because you want as little surface area as possible. So if your stuff runs on Alpine, great, run it on Alpine. Um, Alpine's a perfectly reasonable production quality image, um, but um, both work and we support them both in .NET, so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, Mitchell Ransom's asking about WSL1 on Docker, had to do quite a lot of steps. Yes, WSL1 and Docker sucked. WSL2 and Docker is a checkbox. And actually go to, um, here's another part of the advertising portion of the show. Go to Hansel Minutes. I have a podcast and I would encourage you to check it out. I'm very proud of it. On that show, I had uh, Simon Furkwell, uh, who is the, one of the lead developers on Docker Desktop, talk about how they did it, why it's useful. So I would encourage you to check that out. Um, Dan Haywood, how does Windows Update play with WSL? It, Windows Update updates the WSL kernel, but the distributions are managed by you. So once you've brought it down, from the store, when you go to the Windows store and you download a WSL, you're really just downloading a tar file. You're downloading an archive that we're gonna unzip. And it, we don't update it. It does not get updated. Uh, Alistair is asking about a manual kernel update installer. Originally, uh, the kernel was built in, but we needed it to be basically pulled out and, and, and made um, secondary. When you go to Windows Update, Windows Update updates Windows. But then there's this underneath thing called Microsoft Update. When you go into my, uh, Windows Update and you say, allow us to update other kinds of software, that's how you get like your NVIDIA tools and all that kind of stuff. So we needed the Linux kernel to be not part of Windows. It needed to be part of the Microsoft third-party um, installer stuff. The manual kernel update is a one-time thing and only for people who are uh, on the fast ring. So you don't need to worry about that stuff. Dan's asking about antivirus stuff. There's no antivirus, you're in Linux. The antivirus doesn't affect it because it's inside of a VHD, that virtual hard drive. And um, that virtual hard drive is opaque and not seen. Um, let me go ahead and take off. I need to go and eat and I'm getting a little lightheaded. Maybe we can have uh, uh, Stella come back and just thank our sponsorship and bring up that, uh, that slide again. Um, Hi, Scott, yeah. thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Scott. Um, obviously, we're all in a room. We'll be doing a big round of applause. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so we'll, this will be recorded, so we'll get it out. But, yeah, generally, really appreciate it. Um, go and enjoy your tacos. And, um, yeah, we, with regards to our next meetup, um, we have Ian Cooper confirmed for the 6th of August, talking about TDD, when it all go wrong. Um, we'll put some more information out shortly. But, obviously, yeah, thank you very much, Scott. It was generally brilliant. So, uh Thanks, Scott. And yeah, we'll be we'll be releasing the recording next week if anyone wants to watch again or or uh, or miss any parts of it. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll get that out to all the all the user groups next week as well. And uh, I think that's everything from our side. If anyone's got any more speaker or topic suggestions, uh, let let Mick and myself know. We'd love to hear them too. Cool. Thanks Cheers. very much, Scott. Brilliant. Right. Cheers. Thank, Thank you very much. much. See you guys later. Thank you very much. Cheers, Cheers bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Carol. Bye. Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Scott.